going to see if I can move over here and not have to stand right at the podium. So I'm going to take maybe five minutes and just give you a really brief overview of what the Lawala Community Alliance is. And then we're going to talk very specifically about some tools that we use in the community to plan with the community, to implement with the community, and to evaluate with the community. So how many of you are uh, familiar at all with Lawala? Good. So probably most of you have heard of the Lawala Clinic. It was founded by two brothers, Milton and Fred Ochiang, who came here to Vanderbilt Medical School. Um, they had originally come to the US to go to Dartmouth College and then on to Vanderbilt. While they were here in school, their parents uh, tragically both died of AIDS. And they took that as a call to action to provide health care back in their home community. And four years ago, they opened a small rural health clinic in order to provide services to the people back at home. Since then, we've grown substantially. And so I want to talk about that briefly so you get a broader view of what Lawala is, um, something beyond just a health clinic. Again, let's see if I can get this to work. My name's James, and I, I run the organization. My colleague, Catherine Falk, is also here. Milton and Fred are now re in residency as young doctors. Fred is in um, medicine and pediatrics here at, at Vanderbilt, but he's on call. So our, our basic mission is to build the capacity of the people of Lawala to advance their own comprehensive well-being. And for us, comprehensive means not only physical health, but educational opportun opportunity, economic development, cultural vitality. And so it's a multi-dimensional community development model. Um, some of our successes in the last four years, I mentioned that we've been operating for four years. Uh, we've seen 60,000 patient visits in that time. That's not unique individuals. That's people who are um, getting our services every day. It generally is between 12 and 1,500 patients a month. Um, we have 650 patients on HIV care. It's interesting that Ann Smart came online, isn't it? Um, we have three dozen Kenyan staff at this point. We actually have more than 50 people working for us full time because we're engaged in a building project right now. But there are three dozen staff who are fully employed on contract with us. And we have growing programs. You'll see in a second that we're expanding to have a, a new maternity and an integrative care center for HIV. And we're doing public health outreach and some school-based interventions. And we have an affiliation with Vanderbilt. We're housed at the Institute for Global Health, which has been a tremendous um, partnership for us as an organization. Um, this year, we are bringing clean water and sanitation to 2,000 school students. This is in partnership with a Nashville-based NGO called Blood Water Mission. And we are bringing school uniforms as an incentive to keep girls in school. That's also in partnership with another Nashville-based NGO called Got Your Back. We sponsor high school students. So we sponsor 10, 10 new students a year based on the combination of merit and need. And then finally, we've raised about 1.75 million since the organization started four years ago. These are a list of some of our major funders. So like I mentioned, the model is multidisciplinary, multidimensional. We believe that poverty is not just based on health. I often use the example of, you could imagine there, there might be a young girl who four years ago didn't have access to health care, um, but now she does, which is wonderful. But she, her mother still considers her, her chances poor because the girl doesn't have a very good chance of, of attaining a secondary school degree. So if we can up that girl's educational chances, but she doesn't have any economic chances when she comes out of school, she still considers her opportunities poor. If we can keep her in school um, and get her a, a job in the community, but she takes no pride in place, she has no sense of cultural pride, then she's likely to leave the community. And then we, we see that there's an intrinsic link between the material and also a sort of a spiritual poverty that people um, encounter when they, when they lose uh, family members and friends to HIV, or even a girl in that situation, she may um, get a high school degree, but uh, now she, she doesn't seem to have any peers. No one understands what it, what it means to be a girl with education. So, so uh, we also look to, to build up what I might call the hope sector in the community.
So some of our services, we offer clinical care. Um, like I mentioned, we have a new wing, which is tripling the size of our operation. This is Fred Ochiang on the, le uh, on the end of the slide here. And I'll tell you this interesting story real, real quickly. Fred, this, this baby was brought in six months old, had been accidentally fed um, pesticide that was meant to be applied topically to a cow um, as in, instead of uh, cough syrup. Um, the mother was illiterate, so she couldn't tell the difference. The baby was brought in in a kind of comatose state. The brothers were both there at the time, Milton and Fred, and they had a lot of trouble gaining IV access on the child. So they had to do something which was quite desperate. And you can see here the neck of the child. They weren't in an ICU. They didn't have an ultrasound. They didn't have a pediatric surgeon. Um, but they, in order to save the child's life, had to cut in and uh, insert a, an, a central line using um, a peripheral IV. Um, we do public health outreach in the community through water and sanitation and hygiene training, um, through a curriculum called home-based life-saving skills, which is focused on um, infant mortality and maternal mortality. And then we do outreach to schools um, through, like I mentioned, uh, we have funding through Ronald McDonald House Charities, but we're also doing water and sanitation outreach to the schools. We have education programs. We sponsor or we support girls through this uh, girls' school uniform initiative. Uh, we sponsor 10 new school, uh, students each year. And we're providing water and sanitation at 13 area schools over the next three years. We also have some microenterprise. It's very small scale. We employ women as a part of a sewing cooperative. And that's through partnership with Thistle Farms here in Nashville. You see the women are making these, uh, these small bags in the second picture. And in the last picture, you see the bags are used to package the Thistle Farms uh, products. And here in the third picture, you see the women making the school uniforms in partnership with Got Your Back. So that's Lawala. But the most important question today is this question of how do we plan, implement, and evaluate together? And this is a core part of who we are as an organization because we are founded by Kenyans and we're working, we've honed our focus to one community. So we're trying to do everything that we do in uh, collaboration with the community. Um, my wife Jenna and I often talk about this as being the difference between a speedboat and a sailboat. A, a speedboat gets you from one side of the lake to the other as fast as you possibly can. But it doesn't take into account anything um, but efficiency, right? So a speedboat as an international NGO might be an organization that comes in, places a hospital and as many resources there as fast as possible, opens a school as fast as possible, and offers services to the community. But a sailboat is a boat which requires collaboration. It requires dependence on knowledge, um, work as a team. It requires you to wait for the wind, right? So that's what we think of as participation in the community. It's a little bit slower. Um, it certainly is not nearly as efficient, but it's a lot more beautiful when it works. And it's a lot more sustainable. You're not dependent upon fuels. You're dependent upon the energy that the Earth naturally provides. So this is an awesome piece of um, research that came out of Nairobi back in 1998. And it's a, a participatory continuum. And we use this as sort of a, a grade report on how we're doing in the community. On the upper left, you have sort of the worst kind of dynamic between the community and any sort of international NGO. We call it coercion. It's where the, sim uh, the community simply submits to the predetermined ideas. We all know what this looks like. And it's characterized by doing two. You haven't asked me what, what I want here in my home village. Um, you're simply coming in and doing it to me. And as we move down the continuum, we get into more positive dynamic between the community and um, any sort of um, NGO. So maybe in the middle, we have consultation, where the local people's opinions are asked but outside people analyze and decide on a course of action. This is a, a, at least a couple of steps better, characterized by doing four. We try to operate as much as we can in this, in this darker area of the continuum. Cooperation, where work, uh, local people work together with outsiders to determine at least the priorities, right? That the priorities are named by the community. I often think of this as any time that I go to a meeting in Lawala, people give me what I might call a honey-do list. Right, a, a Christmas wish list of things that they wish were different. And as much as I, I've grown to resent that sometimes, I also know that it, at least it's there 
honey-do list. It's not mine. And it's their list of priorities. So that might be considered cooperation. Where we really try to operate is in this stage called co-learning, where local people and outsiders work together to create goals, to execute those plans, and to evaluate. So that's where I get planning, implementing, and evaluating together. This is the zone um, that I would say is most successful. You could go one step further to this community-initiated idea, but I would actually say in our case, where we are an international NGO, that it kind of takes um, the relationship out of the equation. Um, and we believe that there's actually a role for the outsider as well. So we try to operate in this co-learning. And each year, uh, a couple of times a year, we get together with the staff leadership in Luwala and the community leadership, and we ask them to rate us on this scale. And they're pretty harsh sometimes, but it's good to be reminded, and at least it gives us something um, to go after. So let me, let me explain one good mistake that we've made. And this happened early in the life of the organization. So four years ago, um, bef maybe five years ago, before the clinic had even opened, Milton and Fred Chiang took some friends from Dartmouth um, to go and help them build the clinic. And while they were there, these friends, they saw some, some students who were out of school, some high school age students who should have been in school. They were really charming kids. They were always around. They were dynamic. Um, they became friends with the university students from Dartmouth. And these university students went back to the US and they said, wow, you know what? We should really sponsor those kids. It'll make a big difference in their lives. And they called up one of the community leaders um, who had been an educationalist and who, who had worked um, as, a, as a secretary in the National Teachers Union. And they said, look, uh, Mr. Abuya, we think that you would be a great chairman of an education committee in the community. We want to sponsor these kids, and we think you should chair the committee. Mr. Abuya promptly goes back to the rest of the community leadership, and, they, and he says, you know, the Americans want to sponsor these 10 students, and they've appointed me chair. You can imagine this dynamic, right? It's a, he's been almost ordained. And so we spent the next four years trying to make up for this mistake. These kids were not chosen because of merit or because of need. They were chosen because of what I would call proximity and charisma. And Mr. Abuya was put in charge not because the community had selected him, it wasn't democratic at all, but because the Americans had found him charming and charismatic as well. So we spent the next four years trying to make up for that issue. So you see, we have out-of-school teens mixed in a cocktail with American idealism and an ordained chairman, and we have sponsorship based on proximity versus charisma and charisma. Not a good combination. In, in response, we've started a program called Quality Education Through Participation. Maybe you can pass those out. Can someone help Catherine so we can get just the top one, Catherine, not the second one? Yeah, it's double-sided. So I'll talk about this program. This was initiated by um, an, a really interesting Peabody grad named Kelly Baird. She works as our educational coordinator in Lawala. And the idea here was that instead of coming to the schools with, with our own notions of what improvement would be, that we'd ho hold a series of focus groups in the community and ask them open-ended prompts to ascertain what their goals and dreams for their own school advancement would be. And then we'd use their input to drive our programs. I know this seems really basic, but it's actually kind of rare in the NGO world, as far as I can tell. So um, the, the thing that was most interesting was their responses were based on, um, they were based on spontaneous responses given to an open-ended prompt. I wonder if there's one left for me so I can look at it too. So if you look at the first side of this, I haven't given you all, their, all of their answers, but they were asked to identify those barriers to education or to attendance for school children. And I've just given you some of the highlights because I want to take you through the process that we went through. So we talked to 17 focus groups, and these were stakeholders that represented parents in the school. They represented the school management committee, which is similar to a, a school board. They represented the school leadership, as in the head teacher or administration, the teachers, and we brought in students to the fold, which was uh, unique. A lot of times the, the other stakeholders would say, what role does the, do the students have in, in this, in this decision-making process? Students didn't ordinarily see themselves as having 
agency. And then we also involved religious leaders in the community and area administration. So 17 stakeholder meetings. And we asked them to name what they saw as the primary impediments to school attendance. And I've just categorized a few of them here that came up um, frequently. One, lack of uniforms was mentioned spontaneously by 14 of the 17 stakeholder groups. And then when we asked them about what their infrastructure and material needs for quality education were, uniforms were brought up again by seven out of the 17 focus groups. When we asked again about conditions that prevent school attendance, monthly periods for girls were mentioned by 10 out of the 17 focus groups. So again, this is coming up spontaneously. And how schools can help students stay healthy, providing sanitary towels were mentioned by four of the, of the um, focus groups. So we used those um, inputs from the stakeholders, and we collected those ideas for future programs. You can see step two was identifying what the, what the stakeholders had recommended. And then as we turn the sheet over, we use that to identify a partner. So in this case, it's our friends from Got Your Back who are here today, which is awesome. And, and we said to them, look, we know you do school uniforms, but can we use school uniforms to address a felt need of the community? Some of the other um, uh, impediments to attendance that were named by the school community were also early marriage, teenage pregnancy, right? So we thought if we could only keep the girls in school and help them um, stay past, stay into secondary school, we might be able to address some of these needs that the community is naming. So how could we use school uniforms, which is something that the community named as a material need, to, as an incentive for keeping girls in school? And since we know, knew that monthly periods were a reason that girls were having a hard time uh, staying in school, what could we do to address that? So as I mentioned, we have a sewing cooperative in, in Lawala, and so we took the community's input we took the sponsorship from a donor, and we said, let's build the school uniforms um, using our sewing cooperative. Um, we'll give them to girls in classes six, seven, and eight. That's when they ordinarily drop out of school. And we'll accompany each school uniform with a set of reusable menstrual pads. Now, this is like a $10 incentive to the girls, so it's not a terrible cost on our side. But the need was named by the community itself. And so we're trying to address what they, what they said um, with our own programming. Let me give you a second example, if you could pass those out. So I'm going to give you the, the, a two-sheet set of prompts um, that were a response to uh, another set of questions. And I'm going to give you a second uh, to think through them. And based on the, the community's, uh, the, based on the stakeholder input, Decide what, what kinds of programs this would prompt you to institute in the community. So the first sheet is a response to the prompt on what are the infrastructure goals at the school. So you can see our 17 stakeholder groups are listed across the top. And their responses are listed. Um, the black circles mean that they listed it as a high priority. And the open circles mean that they spontaneously mentioned it. But it wasn't necessarily their highest priority. If you look at the total responses, um, that tells you what was brought up the greatest number of times spontaneously by the community. And then under total goals, that's the total number of times it was named as a major priority. Yeah, th these, all of these community meetings were given in Duluo, which is the local language of the community. And I, I, I should say that we, we also trained four community educators to be facilitators of this program and then we went out with them. So there was less chance that it would be looked at as like a, an American standing there asking you what you need. 
um, but these were all um, conducted by school teachers who were from area schools, but they weren't conducting the meetings at their own schools. So think programmatically. If this was the response that you got in the area, and look at that second sheet, responses to a prompt on what had the greatest effect on child health. So given these two responses, is there any way to group any of these in order to have a programmatic intervention that might, that might uh, address the community's own felt needs? Clean water and latrines are pretty high on the list. Anyone else seeing that connection to a number of the issues there? Hygiene and sanitation. That can be linked in with clean water and latrines, right? Hygiene and sanitation. Anything else that links to that uh, general sector? Anything else that relates to hygiene? So um, the felt need is that children are sick and they need first aid at school or they need medical intervention. And the suggestion is, but if you provided water at the school, you could expect that that would prevent some of those sicknesses. So you would see a decrease in that need as you increased health in the community. There's hand washing stations that are also listed here. I would say that's uh, related to hygiene, right? Um, we have. Um, also listed here the need for a health club, health club slash education. Um, that, that could be a club that's involved in hygiene and sanitation, right? So I think that, um, again, I didn't stack the deck here. The community did. So when we look at what their responses were to an open prompt, it's that they have on their own mentioned water, sanitation, and hygiene as a major desire in the community. So this is what we've thought through with the community. We got those same groups back together, and we asked them to select a, a water planning committee that was made up of the same subsets of, of stakeholders, a few students, a few teachers, a few community leaders, um, a few of the, uh, the school leadership. And we asked them to create their own water plans for the school. And, and we asked them to put that on a resource continuum. So on the low end, we have low resource. On the high end, we have high resource. We ask them to think about those, those goals which they have for the school and to put them on a resource continuum. So for instance, under low resources, we would have things like rules and regulations for how their water is to be used. For instance, a lot of the schools in our community have small rain catchment tanks, but the taps have been broken off the tanks. They weren't properly secured. Now, that could be an issue of pure security, that there was no fence put around it. But it could also be just that children are coming up, they're breaking the tap in order to fill a bucket of water, and then it, it empties the whole tank. So there's not a proper sense of ownership or rules and responsibilities governing the water. Sensitization of the parents, hand washing stations, a cleaning schedule for their latrines, a health club at the school, a water treatment for, uh, through chlorine tablets, which is very inexpensive and wash training, which we would provide 
um, through the assistance of Blood Water Mission, we provide uh, wash water and sanitation and hygiene training in, throughout the whole community. So these are resource low interventions, but most of these are in the hands of the school. So part of getting these groups together is to mobilize them towards their own social good rather than just intervening, obviously, with infrastructure. Then we have some medium resource areas in the, in the realm of water and sanitation. Repairing their existing taps. There's a nominal cost of maybe a few dollars. Maybe they have to employ someone with some technical skill to do that. Affixing gutters. Um, it's, a lot of times the gutters have fallen down and they're not draining water into the right place. Building a platform for, for a tank. For instance, a lot of times the tanks are just sat on a pile of rocks, but if you build a proper platform, it'll have a better life. Fixing the doors of their latrines. These are all just examples. Um, if we were to do latrines in the community, we would ask the community itself to dredge the sand from the local river, to dig the pits for the latrines. Um, and then health outreach from the health center where we work is actually very inexpensive, doing childhood immunizations, deworming, and other health campaigns in the schools is a very low cost to us. So this is a, a medium cost item for, for us as an NGO. And then finally on the high resource, we have things like new rain catchment, boreholes, and urine diverting dehydrating latrines, which are a sort of green latrine technology that we've been trying out in Lawala. But you see that these items on the high end don't come at the beginning. And this is the important takeaway from today, is that how much harm you could do by starting on that end of the scale. And you're disempowering the community to do all of the things that they could do on their own, which is actually the bulk of the work. In fact, aside from wash training and health outreach, which requires some sort of technical expertise, the community can do all of this on its own. So the, the onus is on us as, as those who are intervening to think thoroughly about the, the moral obligation we have to not do things for people that they can do for themselves and to simply hold them accountable to do the things which they promise to do. So let me show you technically how we do that in Luwala. We ask the schools to fill out uh, their own school action plan. This is quality education through participation, remember, QEP. We ask them, we give them these forms in a number of areas. So we, we gave them forms um, to fill out for their water plan. We asked them to name their activity, the specific action required, the cost of the action, when it's going to happen, and then most importantly from our side, who's participating. Because we don't see the completion of the action as the end, but participation as the end. So again, back to our sailboat versus speedboat. We could get there really quickly. We could skip to step six as fast as we could. We could skip to the high resource as fast as we can. But if our real aim is teamwork and participation, then we want to see all of these stakeholders involved. So then, let me show you. This is a little hard to read, um, but this is an actual school plan that was uh, created by one of our primary schools. The first goal that they name is sensitization of teachers, the school management committee, pupils, parents, right? And then they, you can see we ask them, well, who's going to be involved in that? The head teacher, the teachers, the parents, the students? And then we have a, a water and sanitation coordinator on our staff who you see that final step is marking whether it's complete. So our job is to monitor whether they're meeting their own goals. It's not to name the goals for them. You can see the second step is the provision, it's still under A, I mean, still under number one, but the provision of tippy taps, that's a simple form of, of, um, of hand washing station that we, that's very inexpensive. The provision of bottles to carry drink, drinking water. Again, really small resource, but the community can do it for themselves. In step number two, we have the repair of the existing water tank. Um, soliciting for funds from the school management committee, purchasing of a tap and gutters, and then we have fixing of the latrine doors. Um, they said that they need the hiring of a skilled uh, workman for fixing the latrines. But you notice none of these involve an outside intervention by the Lawala Community Alliance. All of these, uh, all of the participants in these steps are the local community, the school administration, the students, 
And then I skip steps, uh, steps three and four, but when we get to steps five and six, you finally see under other LCA, which is the shorthand for Luwala Community Alliance. So this is where we're, we're expected to, to assist. Adding one big water tank of 10,000 liters, right? That's a big material object which we can acquire. But at this point, you know that they've built the platform that, for the tank, they have the hand washing stations, they've sensitized the community, they've raised their own funds, they've probably brought in their own sand. The construction of eco-sand eco latrines, those are those urine diverting latrines that I talked about, they want 10 doors, right? And you can see that under other, the LCA is involved. But most importantly, so are they. You can see under the, um, the adding of one big water tank, step A is asking or requesting for f funds from the Luwala Community Alliance. That's fine. Purchasing the tank gutters and um, transportation, harvesting, I can't read this either, hiring skilled laborers. So you can see that they're expecting under the participant responsibilities that the LCA play a big role in that, but also they're expecting to raise some of their own funds. So this is just an example of what we're doing. Now you can see that none of these steps have been completed. If you look at the, the far side of the slide, um, we haven't gotten to any of these things yet because steps three and four of the community have not been completed. So let me talk about a mistake. Failing to plan and implement together. I talked about these three steps. I showed you the water plans. And despite our best practices, sometimes we still screw up, right? So in January, um, when I was, I was, I just came back from Lawala two weeks ago. While I was there in January, Milton Ochiang, the older brother, received a phone call that someone he had known from St. Louis was coming to Lawala and bringing a group of five American visitors and five Kenyans on a drill team. And they wanted to drill three boreholes in the community. As fast as they could, they had seven days to be in Lawala. Now, we're not ones to look a gift horse in the mouth, right? But at the same time, what does that speedboat mentality do to our sailboat programming, right? So we've already laid out these low resource areas, these medium, medium resource areas. But the schools hadn't completed them yet. We had just had these meetings in November and December. They hadn't had a chance to organize themselves and complete all these steps. And all of a sudden, boom, we've got a new borehole. This is way on the high end. Right? They're coming, they're drilling. This is on the very extreme of what we've promised we're going to do. So you can imagine the, the, the way that if a, a school who hasn't completed step one of their own water plan, how disempowering it can be if someone shows up and drills a borehole. Not only that, if the outsider chooses which school is going to receive the borehole, regardless of how they're doing compared to their peer schools, then they could be incentivizing poor behavior. And the peer schools who maybe have made it further on their own water plans and have been empowered to their own social action are disempowered by seeing their peer school receive some sort of high resource despite the fact that they've done nothing to attain it. So I'm admitting our own mistakes in this. Let me show you one final example from a macro level of how we also use this sort of community involvement. Again, our goal is always planning, implementing, and evaluating together. So each year, we create a strategic plan with the, the school, uh, sorry, not the school leadership, the community leadership. We have a committee in Lawala called the Lawala Village Development Committee, which serves an advisory role on all of our work. They also serve a, a sort of governance role by overseeing all of the financial transactions that happen every month. They've got to um, look at the accounting from the prior month and okay the budget for the upcoming month. And this is the executive committee of the Luwala Village Development Committee and five of our staff leadership. And we get together and we have a, a retreat every, every six months to evaluate how we're doing on our program planning. And so last year in 2010, I'll just show you one goal. The community leadership named, the, it, was, it was about time that we regain community involvement. And the reason they said that was, if anyone's seen the Sons of Luwala film, the community had mobilized to dredge sand from the river. They offered free labor. But you can imagine as you add more resources to a project, 
the community becomes a little bit more hesitant to do work on their own. So it's the same, Chanta talked about how the, the NGO presence in Cambodia meant that people expected to be paid to attend trainings. So it's, it becomes harder and harder to get people to do things on their own as you bring more and more resources into the community. So we had seen that. And so the, the strategies that the community leadership named is they had to identify the causes of discouragement. They said that they were going to conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews. They were going to uh, inquire at the Luwala Village Development Committee meetings. They said that they were going to re-educate the community through showing of, uh, Sons of Luwala, the movie, which shows how desperate Milton and Fred were to raise funds. And if these two brothers from the community were out there begging for money, why can't the community itself contribute? And that they were going to conduct follow-up discussions after the movie. In order to get more community involvement, they were going to engage the local administration by inviting them to join the development committee, by um, writing official letters, and that they hoped that the local administration could mobilize people better. And then we were going to solicit local resources by adding a fee at the, at the um, clinic, um, implementing a new service fee, and soliciting volunteer labor from the community. So you can see as we get together throughout the year, we, we evaluate our progress. Some of these things showed some completion. Some of them showed just progress in the sort of generic. And some of them were completed. But it's the community's job to name and to be held responsible for what they did um, set out as a goal. And we see our job as just monitoring um, whether they met those goals. Um, and then we did a similar strategic planning session this year where we evaluated how we did on the ten or nine goals, I think it was, from 2010, and we used those to generate our 2011 goals. And we do this through breakout sessions where different members of the committee uh, sit down and they, they name what the strategies to accomplish each goal are. So I'll end here. These are three tools that we use. I showed you the first one, which is quality education through participation which is a general way to get stakeholder opinions. The second one is a, is a planning tool, which we used in particular on our, on our water planning. And the third one is sort of a broad level strategic planning that we do with the community. And I'll take questions now. Quentin. Sure. Here we go. And I can stand at the podium. Next. Yeah, hi. Um, I was kind of curious how you navigated the issue of the borehole. It seems like they started doing it. Um, so you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. There's money coming in. You don't want to reject them at the same time. Uh, could potentially cause a lot of disruption. So in the case of the borehole, I mean, we had to make decisions quickly, and, and there was some community backlash. Um, but we made the most um, balanced political decision that we could, given that we didn't want to not take the resource. We had them drill one borehole at the clinic, um, which will then be capped um, with a submersible pump, which we'll use other funding to do. And then we um, had them sink a borehole at a local secondary school where some of our scholar students are. That's a secondary school with more resources, and they're not a part of our, our WASH intervention, so we weren't going to capsize the planning program. But then we were, we were originally asked to sink a borehole at Lawala Primary School, which is the most local school, but they were actually the furthest behind on their own water plan. And so we, we, we had to make a tough political decision and not sink a borehole there. And we, we went to another geographic location, which is in our catchment, and a part of our pilot schools for the water programming, and sunk one there. And it was basically, we picked a geographic triangle. But you can imagine, it's caused a certain amount of community grievance against the organization for bringing in this resource without, we just didn't have time to plan with them. Um, and we certainly didn't implement th with them on the project. We will evaluate with them, and I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll be, um, uh, they'll have some things to say. Other questions? I think that was an excellent presentation. 
I particularly want to commend you on talking about mistakes that you made and that you've learned from, because I think largely in the NGO community, people hide their mistakes and don't disclose uh, for fear of funding issues or competition. And uh, I think, but what from your presentation, it's clear that I think we learn the most from our mistakes and it just benefits the community as a whole. And uh, But on that note, did your funders, what kind of response did you get from your funders when you do, I imagine you did talk about these these issues and how do they respond to that? Is, is it a positive response? Is it, I, and I'm just curious because yeah. I think this, this could be, uh, it would be interesting to find ways to incentivize or motivate other organizations to also have these conversations. Yeah. Ironically, my biggest water funder is sitting in the room right now. So <laughs> and we can ask them. The, um, I, I think that Blood Water Mission, who supports our water projects, I don't just say this because I am married to their executive director, but I say this because I actually agree with their approach. Um, they understand the, they propagate this, this sailboat sort of process. And so the water planning, the committees that were formed, the stakeholder groups, that's all within Bloodwater's ethos. So it's easy for them to understand when something goes wrong outside of that, that we're just trying to veer back to the original. Um, it does become, I mean, it does become sensitive when you have a funder who's engaged with you in that long-term community participatory approach and someone dives in and takes sort of a high dollar um, asset in because you, you don't wanna, you don't wanna take the credit away from the funder that's moving slowly and appropriately. But the, the other mistake that I mentioned having to do with the, the school sponsorship, we literally had to disband the education committee that was formed because the, the man who had been ordained as their, as their chair was ru running the committee like an autocrat. And, and the committee was specifically sponsoring children not based on need or merit. They had already established a pattern of sort of giving to people who were close and family members and things like that. So we had to start another education selection process where students write essays and they, they submit their grades and they get school uh, teacher recommendations. Um, and so we have a, a less biased process now for selecting new students. Kelly. And unfortunately, time-wise, this is gonna be our last question, but okay. I bet James will hang out for a minute or two. Sure. And um, if you would, on your evaluations, please leave them on your chairs and I'll collect them. We also have a table out to the side. Um, so if anyone's interested in grabbing a brochure, I have some here with me. Catherine has some and we have a table out in the next room. The other thing that I would be remiss not to take any microphone uh, uh, chance to say is that we're going to be opening this new maternity in March and hosting a big celebration here in Nashville in April. So. Um, if you're interested in information, just sign up and we will um, get you information on when the celebration for the new maternity is happening. Kelly. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your exit strategy and what that looks like? Because I would find it hard to believe that you're not kind of already thinking about that since this is so big based on community empowerment. And then are, um, are there plans to take this model to other communities? Exit strategy, thanks. Sorry if that talks about your future. <laughs> when am I going to quit my job? And <laughs> no, the, um, you know, there's always a complicated tension between the value of sustainability on the one hand and local ownership and the need for, for, for social services. So in Lawala, for instance, four years ago, there was no access to health care at all. And the cost of that care is astronomical. So we are spending a lot of money every year to provide a small hospital, to provide HIV care, and those services couldn't be offered if the community were expected to pay for it on their own. I showed in one of the slides that we asked the community to chip in a, a larger fee. And when we did so, our, our patient numbers were cut in half. When we asked community members to go from paying about 75 cents a visit to, to a differentiated fee based on whether what labs and clinical and drugs you've got. So it went up as high as $4 a visit. And, and they, it not only dropped, but it dropped disproportionately that people favored um, adults over children, where traditionally 58% of our patients are children under five. All of a sudden, about 25% of our patients were children under five. 
So as much as I believe in sustainability and I want the community to be the driver, I also see the role, just as I said on the original slide, for outside funding. Um, because right now, as much as I would like for our healthcare institution and our education programs to be self-sustaining, I think that the only way that our programs will ever be self-sustaining in Kenya is if we can generate more income generation in the community and so that people can actually pay for the cost of their own services. We spend about $15 a patient, and they pay between a dollar and $3. So no matter what I do right now, I can't get them to pick up the whole tab. But we are moving as much as we can to get them to contribute. And you know, I think of participation as participant action. And so maybe there are uh, small steps towards sustainability, and the biggest is asking our community participants to take action. On the final point of are we hoping that this model will be picked up elsewhere, of course. Um, it's not our specific organizational mission to implant this model in other communities. Our mission is to, we've really honed our focus to one community, and we're trying to um, ha have sustainable change there over time and to address poverty in a multidimensional way. But we certainly have interest from people coming and trying to learn from what we're doing and trying to plant it in other places. My guess is we will spread contiguously from this location out to communities that surround us. Thank you all.